right. All right. Are we ready this morning? We're ready. You're fired up? How many of you know what we've been teaching about? Kingdom of, you can put it back up there. Kingdom of God. Is the kingdom of God many people? How many Christians do we have in the house? Raise your hand. They ain't got it yet. They ain't got it yet. How many citizens of the kingdom do we have? All right. All right. All right. All right. You'll learn it today. It's okay. We're going to teach you today. We are citizens of a kingdom that is not of this world. We're not. We got rid of religion because Christianity, the name Christianity came in with religion. So we're no longer religious. All right? We're not. We're not religious. All right? We're not. We're not. We're not, we don't go by rules and all these things, and we'll go by the Word of God. We live because the Word of God is our constitution. It's our declaration of independence, okay? You're going to learn about a kingdom. So the first message was about God's original plan. God's original plan for me and you was to, it was not to get us to heaven. It was to bring heaven to earth, all right? All right, that was the original plan. I went back to Genesis, and I showed you. What God's plan was. Number two was about how to restore the kingdom back unto us. All right? When you get the kingdom restored, what is the first thing that another country, when one country is going to dominate another one and take over it, the first thing that they do is defeat the enemy. All right? So in order to be a kingdom to be restored, the first thing that we have to do is have our enemy defeated. And who defeated our enemy? Jesus came, defeated the enemy, and gave us the keys to the kingdom. And said, here you go. Here you go. He gave us the keys to the kingdom. So he restored unto us what was taken from Adam. Amen? Come on, somebody. And I gave you two other steps. Where were they? What does the nation got to do? Once the, once the nation gets restored, once the enemy gets defeated, huh? No. We have to de you declare your independence. So that means... You no longer depend on what you used to depend on. You've declared your independence from Satan, from darkness, from sin. You say, I don't know, I am no longer under sin, but I'm under grace. You declared your independence, and the third thing was you established a constitution. Amen? And just like the children of Israel, when they came out of Israel, what did they do? He de the Lord defeated Pharaoh, defeated the enemy. He let my people go. He had to let them go. Once they got loose, they declared independence from Egypt, even though some of them still wanted to go back to Egypt. They said, we don't want to be independent from Egypt. We want to get back under the yoke of slavery, of bondage. So many times believers, they say that. They get saved, and then they go right back and say, I want to still live this way. And they haven't declared their independence. In order for you to become a citizen of a nation, you have to renounce the nation that you came from. You have to say, you know what? I no longer want to live this way. I am no longer a part of that country. I am a part of the kingdom of God. And I now live. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. Okay? And then they established the constitution. What did, what did God give the children of Israel? He gave them the Ten Commandments. All right? The new constitution in the New Testament, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Our constitution is the New Testament. It's the word of God. It's our testament. Amen? So that's how you restore a kingdom. Now, today we are entering the kingdom of God. And that's why God, just like Sister Sylvia said, they rolled out the red carpet for you. Well, Jesus rolled out the red carpet for you and me. And look at the gates. They said, come on in. But see, so many people see this picture as when you die. You don't have to die to enter the kingdom of God. You can live in the kingdom life today. And so many people, are, I know our preachers message are like, but how, how? Today you're going to learn how to enter in. Amen? Are you ready to learn how to enter into the kingdom of God? How to, how to exercise these things? Because today you're going to get the keys to enter into the kingdom of God. We're going to use the word of God. And I'm going to show you some things today that I know that will help you and that will bless you. If you take them and you apply them, you will get in. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. Look at your neighbor and say, it's going to be good today. Hallelujah. Let me open up these and praise the Lord. Um, so, let me go here. 
I want you to turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, when you're there, say amen. amen. Glory to God. Aren't you glad that you come in here to get the word of God? Today you're going to get the principles of the word of God on how to live. I'm sharing some of the Constitution today with you. Many of us live in the United States, we never read the Constitution. You never read the Declaration of Independence. You never know how free you were. You never know your rights. You never know anything. You never knew that you really had legal right to do the things that you want to do. And sometimes your rights are taken from you and you don't even know. But we're going to get into the Word of God. That's why it's important for you to bring your Bible. Look, for those that didn't bring their Bible, they're like, bring the Word of God. Well, I got my phone. What if it dies? This never dies right here. Amen. Amen. You're like, yeah, stop making fun of us, Pastor. Stop making fun of us. Okay, we're going to just start here. I know I don't have verse 1 there, but I'm going to read verse 1 and 2. Okay, it says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night, and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Just real quick, that statement is a very powerful statement. Nicodemus just told Jesus something very, very profound that I don't even think Nicodemus understood what he just said. He says, we know that there's something great that you are doing. We know that the power of God is in you because of why? Because of all the things that he had did. If you just, if you, if you want to know what he did over there in, in chapter 2, verse 23, it says, uh, that now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. what See, what, what signs did he do? What did he do? He brought the kingdom of God to the earth. He saw the kingdom already. He saw it being displayed. He saw it living out. And therefore, he came to Jesus at night. And what does Jesus tell him in verse, in verse 3? Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So what did he do? He displayed the kingdom. He displayed the benefits. Before he ever tried to say, have you, you got Jesus in your heart? You want to get born again? Have you been saved? Before he did all that. I love when there's a quote by, by uh, St. Francis. Francis says, preach the gospel at all times. And when necessary, use words. He said, preach the gospel at all times. And when necessary, use words. What was he saying? Live it. Live it. Walk it. Display it. Make people want to ask you. We know that God is with you because of the signs that you do. We know that nobody can do that unless God was with you. Pastor, we know that that was God. Have you ever prayed for somebody and, and something happened where they got healed or they got delivered? You know, we, we prayed for people sometimes and they got delivered and they're like, whoa, they felt God. They knew that God was with us because the signs that we did. That, that right there is, is, is what I'm telling you about. The way, the way that you love. You've had people at your job saying, how can you, how can you stay, how can you work with them the way they talk to you? You know, or how can you, you know, if that was my mom, I'd tell her off. These are things that People can't explain. They just know that you, they say, well, you sure, you got to have God because of the way that you respond. This is, this is, these are kingdom, kingdom uh, things that are coming out of you. Amen. And when people see the way that you respond and love and the things that you do, they'll want to know. They'll come, they may come to you at night, just like, just like what happened here. And, and look at verse four. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time? into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus, this is what Jesus answered. Look, look at it says there. He says, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. All right? He's telling you how to enter now. Unless you are born of the water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Okay? He says, and this is, this is, he goes on because he already knows Nicodemus' next question. He says here, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. He said, the wind blows where it wishes, 
and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone born of the Spirit. He knew Nicodemus was like, how is that? I mean, how? He says, well, what about the wind? Can you, what does it look like? I don't know, but you know it's blowing. He was telling them the same thing. If you can't understand the wind, you can't, you're not going to understand this. You want, me to, you want me to explain it to you. I'm trying to explain it to you that you must be born again. Now, what is being born again? What is being born of water and what is being born of the Spirit? Because right now I'm going to tell you something that so many times, I, I'm, gonna, I'm showing you two pictures here, okay? What is that? What are those displayed? The picture on the left, what, what would you say that is? Huh? Baptized in water, right? Okay. What about the one on the right? Huh? I'm going to show you the difference between being saved and being born again. Okay? Born again. This is a, he became a kingdom citizen. Saved. Salvation. There's a difference between being saved and being born again. They're not the same. All right? This man got saved from hell. Every one of us was on our way to hell. And when you accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, you were saved. You were saved from hell. But you can be saved living on the earth and never be born again. It's, good. it's two different things. And, and so many people, they're satisfied with just being saved from hell. Now, I'm happy for you. But if you want to enter the kingdom of God on the earth, you've got to be born again. Okay? You see, Jesus was baptized in water, and he was baptized in the Spirit. You see the Spirit coming down? This is Jesus. Okay? So, born again versus being saved. Let's go on in this same chapter because Jesus talks about it. He says, just as Moses was lifted up in the, he says, in the, in the wilderness, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. He says that, that whatever, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. When you get saved, you have eternal life. You're going to live. You're gonna, when you die, you're going to go to heaven. Boom, you're going to have eternal life. It's all good. And he tells them that. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So you're gonna, when you get saved, there it is. There's the greatest scripture that everybody quotes, the, the gospel in a nutshell. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus came to save every one of us. Amen? So how many of you are saved? Three people, Mira. How many of you are saved? How many of you born again? Because unless, look, I'm going to take you another, Acts, go to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, I'm going to show you something real quick. Um, Acts chapter 19, there was another scripture here, verse 1. And it happened, this is Paul, he's going through these different places, and he encounters some, some guys. It happened while Apollos was in Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, we have not even so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. So they were saved. They were saved, but they never received the Holy Spirit. They never got born again. Amen? They never got born again. So, listen, real quick. What is the baptism of water? What is it for? Say that again. Yes, it is. But the water baptism is a baptism of repentance. Okay? So when Jesus came in Matthew, I believe it's 417, when he says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He says, turn around, change the way you do things. And the baptism of repentance was a part of you renouncing that old life and living in the new life. Amen? So baptism, when you were baptized and submerged, you died with Christ and you rose again. Once you rose again, your house was clean. He says, now I can deposit my spirit in there. Because he's not going to put his spirit in there where there's uh, all this ugliness, I guess, dirty. God is not going to share a house with a stinky closet. Come on, somebody. That closet that's dirty, that smells, he just, 
He says, I'm coming in, I'm cleaning out the whole house. So therefore, when you get baptized, you've repented, you have uh, demonstrated for your, your life that you live for God, and now you have been given the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit comes, and this is how you enter into the kingdom of God on the earth. Amen? How many, have you, you're ready to enter in. That's, that's, that's one right there. That really, that really, uh, according to the word of God, is really what, what God tells us to enter into the kingdom of God, to be born again. But I got two more things. I got two more things that he, he says in here that I think is very, very vital for us. Um, so I'm going to take you to this next slide here. So that's number one, okay? There's going to be three things that I'm going to tell you today. Number one is born again, entering the kingdom legally and becoming a citizen. Because listen, <laughs> I don't want to go through a lot of this, but because I don't want to keep you here too long, but <laughs> listen, you are here, when you get born again, you're here legally. You're, what, what, what makes you legal here is your body. Okay? That's what makes you legal on the earth. It's, it's your body. And this is the reason why you were able to cast out demons because if you don't have a body, you're here illegally. When a spirit tries to, when you, why do you think when the spirit comes, it tries to enter into a body? Because it's trying to be legal. It's trying to possess something. And when the spirit is there illegally, when you cast out demons, you say you have no authorization to be here. But, but see, this is the thing. When a person is giving that spirit legal right to have dominion there, he's going to stay there. But when you begin to know your citizenship, that you're born again, that Jesus Christ resides on the inside, you can say, I command you in the name of Jesus Go in Jesus' name. And that spirit has to leave because it has no legal right. From the very beginning, if you look at Adam and Eve, that the devil, he had to possess the snake in order to be used to deceive Eve. And God could not intervene. Why couldn't God intervene? Because he would have violated his own law. He could speak from heaven, but he could not, he could not, Come here, like that's why. Why do you think at the end he punished Adam, he punished Eve, and he told the serpent, he said, Look, the serpent, I said, I'm gonna give you a promise. You may have deceived her, but her seed is gonna bruise your head. He's gonna have, he says, I'm gonna come through her seed in the flesh, and I'm gonna bruise your head. And who was that? That was Jesus. I hope you're getting something. You're getting something today. I'm, I'm giving you something today that you, you can chew on for a while. Uh, but this is, this is the thing. All those, any spirit is illegal. It has no legal right for you to, to, uh, to torment you, to hurt you. If you're holding on to unforgiveness, you're, you're giving that spirit a right to, to take residence in your life. You need to let it go. Amen? Let it go. Hallelujah. Let's go here. This is number two. I love this picture. Become like a child. Have faith as a child, the innocence of a child. So here's this young man, but this is the scripture I want, to, I want you to get. It says, then some, Matthew chapter 19, verse 13 and 14. It says, then some children were brought to him so that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, let the children alone and do not hinder them for coming to me. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Okay? And then, here we go, Matthew, I mean, Mark. Is that Mark? Yeah, Mark chapter 10, verse 13 and 16. It says, and they were bringing the children to him so that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. What, what, they got Jesus mad? They got Jesus mad because they were trying to withhold the kids from coming to him. All right? And he, he was indignant. And he said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will, will not enter in. Amen? So I'm giving you here the, another principle that God is telling you that you got to become like a child in order to enter in. When I go back to this picture, here's a young man with a cape. And with, with these things, do you think there's anything impossible to him? Because he's Superman. 
When you tell a child that he can fly, when you tell a child when you grow up, you're gonna be you're gonna be the president of the United States, he will believe you. Why? Why? His thinking hasn't been diluted. His thinking is pure. When, when Jesus says, become like a child, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, in order, he says, blessed are those that are pure at heart, for they shall see the kingdom of God. Keep your heart pure before God. Remember what I, I gave you the illustration earlier today about renovating a house, that everything was messed up. But when you get saved and born again, you begin to see things differently. And no longer do you want to see them in the same light anymore. You start seeing things with the, with the eyes of a child, with the eyes of God. In order to enter into the kingdom of God, you start got to start looking at people the way kingdom looks at them. You're not Christian, you're citizens. Amen? You are not of this world. You are in it, but you're not of it. Amen? You're not a curse, you're a blessing. You're not an accident, you have a purpose. Amen? I'm not in despair, I got hope and a future. I know that, that, that God has greater things in store for me. Jesus says, greater works shall you do, John 14. Greater works shall you do than these. Don't marvel at the things you see me do, because you're going to do better. Why? Because I'm giving you my spirit. Because of the kingdom of God. You are born again. You're born into the kingdom. Remember I told you, in order to enter into a kingdom, how do you become a citizen of the United States? You have to be born into it. And you become born again. You get saved by Jesus, but if you want to enter into the kingdom, you, be, you get born into it. So legal, you have a legal right in the kingdom of God to do the things that you need to do, that he's telling you to do. Amen? So, that's why I'm telling you today that if you want to enter in, you become like a child. Become like a child. Now, there's a difference between childlike and childish. Come on now. You got grown men that act like kids. They throw temper tantrums. You know, come on. Slam the door. And then your wife says, I can't believe you're acting like that. I can't believe you're acting like that. You know? I don't know why you're making it. Why are you crying for? My wife tells me that. She'll tell me that. Time. Why are you crying? Why are you crying? I said, I'm not crying. <laughs> She'll tell me that sometimes. I don't know why you're going to be crying, Juan. I said, when she calls me Juan, then she's really trying to get on to me. She calls me Juan. But I said, I'm not crying. Just leave me alone. There's a difference, church. Being childlike and being childish. Don't tell you why. Don't tell you why. That's because I, I'm childlike. I'm childlike. That's why, that's why I don't want to do nothing. No, that's lazy. That's irresponsible. That's passive. No, God, God never told us to be passive. He told us to have faith like a child. Amen? I love this. You know who this guy is? This is Picasso. Picasso, I love these quotes. He says, all children are artists. The problem is how to remain an artist once he grows up. Because we lose a lot. The things that we go through in life, the people that hurt us, the trials that we go through, the people lie to us, people that sometimes we look up to, they they don't prove to be that person that we could, we could trust. And so we tend to lose all of the, the dreams. We tend to lose all of the vision, all of the, the, uh, our imagination in, in, in what we, when we had when we were kids. And Picasso, man, he, he, he blessed me. He says, it took me, he says, it took me four years to, to paint like Raphael, but a lifetime to paint like a child. He says, the chief enemy of creativity is good sense. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching this message about the kingdom of God and seeing things, but some of you are too smart to receive it. You're too educated. Your intellect won't allow, no, that doesn't make any sense. But Jesus don't make sense. He makes change. Amen? But you're too smart. You're too smart to have faith. 
Tell me the definition of faith. Tell me the definition of faith. I've worked with people with PhDs, and I would tell them, tell me the definition of faith. I know you're too smart for that definition. I'm all for education. I believe in education. I believe that we should study to show ourselves approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. I believe that a workman need not be ashamed. But I'm telling you, when it comes to faith, when it comes to faith, you've got to see beyond your own intellect. If you could figure it out, then you're telling me that you're smarter than God. You can't figure God out. The Bible says his ways are higher than our ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. How can us, our finite minds, we try to figure God out? And say, no, that every, you got everybody else brainwashed, but not me. Uh-uh. I, have a, I have a degree, sir. Mind you, I have a degree. Listen, I'm great. I got a degree too. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean I'm not going to listen to God. Amen? Picasso, you know, 2015, he just broke a record of what one of his paintings went for. If you were to look at one of his paintings, it would be like a child drew it. But it sold for $175 million. One painting. Today, they have his paintings in museums, and people are breaking into museums, stealing his paintings. He is the one artist that has had most of his paintings stolen than any other artist. And his painting, I wouldn't buy his paintings. If I saw it at the garage sale, I'd be like, man, that's trash. But for some reason, smart people buy it. I mean, it ain't going to do me. It ain't going to do me no good, but hey. If you want to hang it in your wall for 175 million, let me draw something up for you right quick. I mean, I'm just saying. But you see, he thought like a child. You know? He created this painting like a child. And he was blessed. And I'm telling you, Jesus used this concept to his disciples because he knew his disciples, their mind was on law. They were on law. You can't do this. You only can do this. He can't be from God. He's from Nazareth, you know. You know, nothing good came out of Nazareth, you know. How does he know so much? He's, he's a carpenter. I mean, they did all these, all these, uh, how can I say, all of these things, his credentials didn't line up with what the, the Messiah was going to have. I told you. And usually what you're looking for is a package. It's, it's, it's in a package wrapped with a wrapping that you're not, that you don't want. Amen? This is number three. Number three. This is, this one here, it's just, it's going to, it's powerful because as I began to uh, study this and I was hearing something, I said, you know what, I got to include that in entering into the kingdom. Okay, so I told you, I read to you the word of God. And I told you the only way you can enter into the kingdom of God is to be born of the water, born of the spirit, right? I told you the difference between being saved and being born again, right? I showed you in the word of God where it said it, right? So you have the knowledge. You have the knowledge of what it takes. The church has been hearing this for years, but we haven't been able to walk it out. Why? Why haven't we been able to walk it out? It's because of your imagination. It's because the way that we think, we, we, we say, yes, I, I, I believe it. Yes, I, I know it. Yes, I read that. Yes, I know this. But you can't see yourself. You can't see yourself blessed. You know, you, you've been dealing with a, with a bad marriage for so many years. You, you, you in your mind, you think, well, she'll never change or he'll never change. Or you know what, I've heard this message and I know, I know they say that I, I shouldn't be lacking, but you, you, you're still living paycheck to paycheck. All these things starts here. It starts here, church, in your imagination. Now, if you can imagine yourself blessed, you'll be blessed. And, and you say, oh, that, that is just so simple. But the imagination is more, has, has more power than you give it. Your imagination has the power to, listen, your imagination has the power to make you cry. It has the power to make you laugh. Your imagination has the power to take you back. Right now, if I were to tell you, 
Can you picture the house you grew up in as a little kid? Everybody can picture that house. Everybody can picture where, where you used to live. If I, if I tell you, do you remember your, your sixth grade coach and somebody that, that had an influence over you? You can, you can picture them. You can remember them. Right now, if I told you, how many doors do you have in your house? Right now, you, couldn't, you never counted them, but if you close your eyes, you can count them. Right now, what are you doing? Using your imagination. I was talking to my son about this, and I said, you know, I really need to get the word out to get them to imagine it. I need them to see themselves in the kingdom and royalty. But he said, yeah, that, I mean, I can imagine all those stuff in my past, but I've never been to a kingdom. I've never been in a palace. So you're telling me you can't think of things in the future? He said, well, no. I said, well, why is it that when people go to the doctor and the, and the doctor tells them you have cancer, they picture themselves dead? You never died, but you picture yourself dead. In a casket, everybody there. You picture it. Your imagination goes there. 